Hello, this is Basic Lighting Techniques for Machine Vision and Session 1, and I'm Daryl Martin with Advanced Illumination, Midwest Sales and Support Manager. I have about 15 years experience in machine vision in general, uh, specifically uh, working with lighting. Uh, before that, I had actually had been with the uh, University of Michigan and done a lot of uh, morphometric image analysis. My, that's my primary background as well as imaging and uh, image processing. So let's go ahead and get started. We have some class objectives. Provide for basic understanding of light as applied to machine vision illumination. We're also going to learn and apply basic rules of thumb for solving lighting applications based on a little bit more of an analysis uh, of the problem. Objective analysis would be a good way to put it. Uh, I'm also going to try to generate some awareness of the flexibility of some of the lighting solutions and the techniques that are available out there for us to use. Uh, I always like to try to suggest a standard lighting method, and I can preface this a little bit by saying that uh, I get a I ask a lot of questions specifically about, uh, gee, can you give me a cookbook? Can you just let me go down through the steps and solve my problem, fix my lighting? And I wish it were that simple, and, and I'll... Uh, reality, but it isn't. So I, what I will do is offer a basic guideline um, to get you through that. So that's where I'll end up at the end here. Okay, class objectives, really, in more detail. Um, you really need a knowledge of the lighting techniques and applications, advantages, and their disadvantages. Okay? It's also good to have some familiarity with your camera sensor quantum efficiency. Uh, illumination techniques, which are really going to be the bulk of what we talk about today as well, and their application fields uh, relative to various sample surfaces. Um, you've also got to have a pretty good familiarity with what I term the four cornerstones of vision illumination. Those would be geometry, structure, color, and filtering. Now, I will get into each of those in a lot more detail, so this is really sort of a preface to what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, also, you want to make sure you have a good detailed analysis of exactly what is happening with your sample with respect to that light. How does that light interact with it? Um, obviously, the immediate inspection environment is a critical issue. We'll go over those in a lot more detail as well, and I'll explain how that fits uh, with the lighting. Okay, so these objectives, really, what are we after when we're talking about vision lighting, what are our objectives? Um, do we want a proper lighting environment? Okay. Do we want a consistent lighting environment? Uh, do we want a light show to, to impress our supervisor? <laughs> you know, and honestly, what do we mean by proper anyway? That's a very indistinct term, okay? So really, and realistically, what we're after is this. We're really after control of the lighting environment. That's what we really want to do. And we want to do that so that we can produce um, a good and sample appropriate lighting application. Uh, we also, to the extent possible, want to standardize on our components, our techniques, our implementation, and of course our operation. And we want reproducibility of inspection results. That's obviously where uh, lighting is a very, plays a very major role in addition to the optics, as you'll see more of this in some of your other classes here. Uh, and, of course, we want robustness. In other words, we want to be able to handle all the different possibilities, all the parts that are available out there. So, to that end, topics we're going to discuss today. Um, I'm going to give you a brief, brief review, really, of light as it's applied to machine vision. Uh, I'm going to compare and contrast lighting sources just briefly. Uh, I'm going to review light sample interactions and camera interactions. We're also going to talk about, uh, we're going to review the, the geometry techniques. I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, lighting is, is, to me, is, is obviously a very visual thing. And in terms of understanding it, it's better to have as many examples as possible. So I'm going to try to give you as, as good a number of examples as I can. Now, this, since this is the basic course, I am only going to cover so many techniques. Uh, I am going to introduce a few techniques that might be offered in an advanced course down the road here. But for now, I'll just preview those, and I will let you know when those, those are uh, being discussed. So really, we're going to talk mostly today about directional bright field versus uh, dark field. We're going to talk about backlighting. And, of course, more uh, applications examples. We're going to preview color. Uh, lighting, and that is really under the purview really of an advanced class, but we're going to discuss a little bit about it. I, I feel like personally that redundancy is important here, and so the more you can get under your, your belt, the better. Uh, we're also going to preview filtering, pass and polarizing. So a little bit of uh, definitions here. These are uh, obviously are going to be probably repeats for some of your other uh, classes. Um, but really what machine vision is is the computer-based characterization of an image okay, from a sensor. 
okay, or a pickup device or whatever you want to call that. Um, a digital image is really a 1D or a 2D array of pixel elements. Uh, pixels, obviously, they each have an X and Y location and have an intensity, okay, 0 to 255. Um, in this case, that would be an 8-bit uh, contrast. Okay, obviously, we have cameras out there that are producing considerably more than that. Color cameras produce 3 times 8-bit or more, or 3 times 12-bit or more contrast as well. Okay, so really when we define, just so we're all clear and on the same level, what we define as contrast really is just that difference between dark, which is a near zero intensity or zero intensity, to near bright or 255 intensity in the case, again, of an 8-bit image, which is fairly typical now still for vision cameras. Okay, so in its most derivative form, really what we're doing is we're characterizing light contrast patterns from a sample. And uh, I get asked this question a lot. I spend a lot of time uh, doing training courses and uh, assisting my customers. And, you know, is lighting, is it art? Uh, is it science? Um, is it a little of both? Now, I have my opinions and I have my feelings about it. I won't make those known now. Uh, but you can think about it after at the end of the, the, the class and see what you think, what, what, your, what your feelings are on it. So if we go back and look at lighting development in general, I think this is a very common uh, situation, uh, wave and look. Okay? Quite simply, that means I take a light, I position it at various places around the sample until I feel like I have a, a reasonably good quality image, and that is my solution. Well, you know, in some cases it still comes down to that, but there's a little bit more involved there, I think, and I think we can be a little bit more scientific about our analysis in terms of, of how we design and work around getting the proper lighting environment. Uh, again, remember, we're talking about consistency, robustness. And so you may have a solution, and I'm going to show you some examples of this, um, but you may not have the whole solution. So we'll talk about that as well. All right. Um, again, testing lights. Um, I can stand here and prognosticate all day, but the bottom line is you still sometimes have to get some samples, get some lights, and test them. So that, that's a, a given. All right, um, I use this term sample appropriate lighting. What we're really talking about then is that light type and that technique that's tailored for your specific application that allows the vision system to do its job accurately and reproducibly. And obviously, you know, what's critical for a successful inspection, we all know that. Um, again, we're talking about robustness, consistency in our environment, and quality. And obviously, the other big issue here is it saves development time as well. So you've got lots of resources, limited resources you have to spend on a large number of things to do, then you want to optimize what you can with the lighting to uh, be able to apply those resources elsewhere. I'm going to switch gears a little now and talk a little bit of a review for light for vision illumination. Okay. Um, characterize light in several different ways, okay? But really, what is, what is light? Light is just a series of photons that propagate as an electromagnetic wave, okay? Now, how you characterize those can vary, okay, by frequency, okay? In other words, it varies inversely with the wavelength, obviously. Um, measured photon intensity, okay? In other words, we're going to talk about radiometric and photometric characterization of light in a bit, just so we all understand the differences. Uh, wavelength. Now, in, in terms of lighting of what we do in this world, um, that tends to be the more common uh, characterization for machine vision, uh, wavelengths. Okay. Um, typically, we express those in nanometers um, or sometimes in microns, depending if you're working with thermal IR. Uh, you're going to be out there a little bit longer, so maybe microns makes more sense than saying, you know, 21,000 uh, know, nanometers or something like that, or 15,000 nanometers, okay? Incidentally, you might notice there are also uh, areas highlighted in red. I did that um, expressly because I feel like these are important concepts to remember, so you want to keep those in mind. Um, those of us who are less familiar with, uh, with, with the size of what, what, is a, what is a nanometer or what is a micron, very small, okay? 100 nanometers is effectively at one ten millionth of a meter, all right? Um, for example, human hair is 100 microns or, or 100,000 nanometers wide, okay? So it gives you an idea of some of this, the, the sizes we're dealing with and how we, we characterize light differently, 
Okay. Um, other concepts that are useful to know because we're going to apply some of these, particularly in a, with respect to diffraction, um, as it applies to backlighting. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So light does diffract or bend around uh, edges. Okay. It moves more slowly or refracts through uh, or disperses through media of different densities, the speed of which is, is relative to the density, the difference in density as well. Um, the amount of refraction is proportional to its frequency and inversely proportional to its wavelength. All right, an example, violet light has a higher frequency. Shorter wavelength, uh, it's refracted more than red through a particular medium. All right, and for completeness sake, I put this in here, but the amount of refraction is really proportional to the ratio of the two different media densities. All right. Um, Here's an example, we've all seen these. Uh, this is uh, just simply a prism, and we've got a white light, uh, which is split into its component uh, wavelengths. And you can see there with a little graphic that the, uh, the, the violet light is, prop or is uh, uh, refracting more, okay? And the red is refracting less, which is what we'd expect. Now, um, a term that we use sometimes is called the index of refraction, okay? And, and the higher that difference is, um, or the, that number, um, you, you get a more drastic change in the speed uh, and refraction of light in particular. Okay. Um, speaking of visible light, you know, we all, we talk about blues and violets and reds and yellows. Um, well, how uh, much of the electromagnetic spectrum is actually composed of visible light? And ironically, it's very small. It's only a thousandth of one percent. And so our eyes see visible light. We don't see UV. We don't, well, maybe Superman does. Um, we don't see UV, we don't see IR, um, but uh, your cameras will in some cases, okay? So we're also going to take advantage of that. Um, but we see just a very small portion. And um, I grabbed this image off the uh, NASA website just because I thought it was uh, very instructive to kind of illustrate some of the differences in uh, um, the, the size or the, the wavelengths. And you might notice, of course, uh, on the far left there, um, radio waves have a very long wavelength, very short frequency. Okay, um, and vice versa with gamma rays. And you can see visibles right there in the middle. There's a very small portion actually blown up so you can actually see it. Um, so I just thought that was instructive. Okay, now if you look at the visible light spectrum in a little bit more detail, okay, just, just really what, because that's really what we mostly involve ourselves with with machine vision lighting. Um, as you can see, UV starts at about 400 nanometers and shorter, okay, to the left. Uh, to the right, you have IR, which is about 700 nanometers and greater. Okay, and again, human visible range there in the middle. I've, I've been sort of touching on the differences in, in these as well. Um, decreasing frequency uh, toward the right, decreasing photon energy also toward the right, okay? In other words, um, uh, an IR light, for example, will have more photons, but it will have fewer, uh, each, each photon is less energetic. And the easy way to remember this is the reason that UV light is just the opposite. UV light has, um, very high individual photon energy, but not that many photons. And that's the reason that it interacts so, um, you know, badly with your skin and damages your skin because it can interact. It's a high energy uh, particle and interacts very uh, well and, and does some damage. So that's just maybe an easy way to remember that. Um, we'll take advantage of a couple of these uh, features, especially of IR light. Um, I won't be discussing this too much here today because this is part of the advanced course. Um, but increasing photometric output, for example, um, can be used uh, with IR lighting to take advantage of, of that. Um, and also penetration depth um, as well. I'll show you some examples of that. So get an idea what that's about. But the longer the wavelength, the better the light tends to penetrate. That has a, a positive effect on samples that are semi-transparent or transparent. Okay. You can take advantage of that and, and uh, blast light right through them. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, measuring and specifying light power because that's an area that has been extremely, uh, there's, there's a lot of discussion about it in the industry and as, as well and even in scientific circles to some extent, okay? And, and uh, I think that there should be a little bit more of a standardized way to, to go about this. So I'm just gonna present what, uh, what I see here. Um, I have to fill you in on a few terms first, okay? Um, and, and it may be better if you go back and take a look at this in a little more detail. Um, afterward, just, just to, to understand, I'm gonna go through it rather quickly here. Um, so if we specify light intensity, we have to come up with a unit, okay? And there are multiple ways to do this. Um, flux is one of those, and obviously we're familiar with 
flux. Okay, you buy a, an incandescent light bulb, it's 40 watts. That's, that's a flux measurement, okay? You can also buy light bulbs in lumens. That's typical for fluorescence, especially white fluorescence, okay? Um, but there are, maybe there are better ways, you know, to, 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 to measure this. So, so we look at maybe something like flux density, which is really, um, it's an it's a amount of flux at a particular distance, okay? At a particular angle of measurement, to make a short story long, perhaps. Um, now, um, the, the two gross ways of, of talking about this really are photometric and radiometric, okay? One of them is weighted to the human eye response, photometric is. Uh, radiometric is, or measures are not weighted, all right? Now, there are certain advantages to having both of those, and clearly you'll see if we look at uh, things like uh, uh, consumer lights, um, fluorescent bulbs, things like that, um, they're going to be uh, weighted toward the human eye response. Okay. So, give you an example here. Um, if I were to take a one watt emitter, okay, um, LEDs in this case, uh, let's say we've got a yellow green LED, 555 nanometers wavelength, okay, one watt, I've got a blue at 470, one watt, um, again, flux. Um, I've got a red at one watt uh, uh, flux also, okay, 660 nanometers. Now, if I take the same measurement and I express these as photometric units, you can see a big difference here, all right? So that one watt nominal device in radiometric flux and photometric flux is now 683 lumens. And it went through a long process to, to develop and measure this out. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, but um, you'll notice that uh, the blue and the red uh, are much, quote unquote, much lower um, intensities, at least as expressed in a photometric term. Okay, so you got to see right away that there's a bit of an issue here in terms of what do we mean by actual intensity and, and how does our eye deal with this versus how does our camera deal with this. So I'm going to show you a little bit about this as well. This is just simply a plot of, of the two vision sensitivities that, that humans have. Okay, we have, a, we have a photopic or daytime intensity um, range as well as uh, um, sensitivity. We also have a scotopic, which is also uh, is a night adapted vision. And you'll notice two things right away. Um, our, at night, our sensitivity goes much higher, over two times higher. Uh, it also shifts to the left, right? Uh, so we tend to be more sensitive in the blue range. Okay, right, blue green, I guess you could call it. So, okay, it's cyan. Um, now, if you compare that with a uh, CCD camera, you're probably wondering where I'm going with this. If you compare that with a CCD camera, um, right up front, um, I think this becomes more apparent because um, if you plot, for example, quantum efficiency, in other words, how effective is this sensor at collecting the light that's uh, incident on it versus wavelength on, on the uh, x-axis, um, you can see right away that a standard sort of analog CCD sensor is considerably more sensitive and it has a much wider range of values available. Um, so, I mean, it, what's apparent here right away is that the human eye is, is woefully inadequate when it comes to a vision sensing device, okay? And um, I think the takeaway from all this really is let your vision system have a look at this first, okay? Don't re necessarily rely on your eyes for everything, especially when it comes to wavelengths. You can see we're very limited in terms of our wavelength range compared with a CCD sensor. So, and obvious way around that is to um, display the camera's contents right on a monitor rather than trying to rely directly on what you see. Okay. Um, so if we look at more detail in photometric versus radiometric units, um, again, flux density, um, we can also specify something called illuminance, okay, which is a, a particular illuminance um, measurement at... Uh, at a, at a specified working distance. I think that's the most straightforward way to deal with uh, light in general. Okay, and those are typically expressed in lux. Again, that's a photometric unit. That is not a radiometric unit. Okay, so that's why you'll see these on uh, fluorescent tubes, for example. Okay. Irradiance uh, is its sister, quote unquote, sister measurement um, in radiometric parlance. Okay, and you, this is a bit more scientific in terms of how it, how it looks. It's watts per square meter. It might be expressed as watts per square centimeter, milliwatts per square centimeter. It doesn't really matter as long as you know what the units are and they're consistent when you're comparing apples and apples. All right, so um, as I've been saying, illuminance is probably an acceptable measure um, or for comparing consumer sources, fluorescent tubes. No problem there. Irradiance, I believe, is better uh, 
then because it's a radiometric unit, it's not going to be biased or expressed based on the human eye. Um, so it's a better uh, choice for comparing monochrome, monocolor light, I will say, monocolor light or monochrome light as opposed to monochromatic. I don't want to get into lasers. Um, but once again, you're still better off to compare apples and apples, reds versus reds, blues versus blues. Um, don't forget about your sensor efficiency. Now, where I'm heading with this is I'm going to show you an example. Uh, basically the same thing right here, uh, actually just in uh, tabular form, uh, reference material uh, for you to look at uh, at your leisure. Okay. So let me give you an example. Um, I, I went to the, uh, the internet and I just grabbed some information right straight off a, a website. Um, LED manufacturer's website, uh, and what we were doing here is basically plotting luminous intensity, okay, and that is a standard uh, SI measure of intensity, luminous intensity in candelas. That's the only um, approved, really, in a sense, measure. Now, so I, all I did was take the data straight from uh, several LEDs. Okay, you can see I've got um, luminous intensity values there for two blues, different wavelengths, two greens, different wavelengths, uh, and two IRs and a red. So, uh, if I were to decide that I needed the most intense light that I could get, quote unquote, the brightest light, we'll leave that at that for now, the brightest light I could get from my vision system, uh, the obvious choice would be what? The green, right? 565 nanometer. It's, it's the brightest, okay? Nominally, that's what you would look at and perhaps conclude that. Now, um, let's look at the same LEDs except expressed as um, radiometric units. Okay, big difference there. So that green 565 that we all thought was so intense and so bright, well, gee, uh, it's maybe not that intense after all, okay? In other words, the radiant power is not that high. And so in actuality, it looks like maybe that blue was the most intense. Now, the other interesting note, and I'll go to the next slide uh, where I just basically uh, put the two together, uh, you'll notice right away that uh, obviously the, the radiant intensity for the two IRs is very high. You notice the radiant intensity for the blues is, uh, I should say, the, uh, the, uh, the two IRs, uh, the luminous intensity is zero. And basically the bottom line reason for that is um, human eyes don't see IR. And so if we go to the logical conclusion of converting to those units, we have zero effective and uh, luminance or luminous intensity. So... Um, not incorrect, but it doesn't give you the full story, okay? Now, another, another little uh, tidbit I will add here is this. If you overlay a standard analog CCD sensor's quantum efficiency curve, okay, uh, you can see right away that obviously th that, that blue 470 and the green 525 are very good choices. A, because they, are very, they have a lot of radiant power, and B, your camera uh, sensor is very much more sensitive to those wavelengths. And that's fairly common nowadays. The older silicon sensors were much less sensitive in the blue-green. Uh, they were more sensitive in the red and even the IR. That's changed now. Okay. So, um, takeaway, compare light sources with the same radiant power, preferably measured at the same working distance, at least. That gives you apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Switch gears on you here. Um, how does light interact, okay, effectively? Well, obviously, you've got a source. Um, you've got a broadband source. You've got narrow band or monochrome sources, okay? Um, how does it interact with your sample? You have things like absorption, reflection, transmission, emission. How does it interact with your pickup device, okay, your lens, your CC dense, uh, or your system digitizer, whatever the case may be, okay? Um, so let's look at sources first. How, how does light interact with sources? Okay, uh, sources in general, uh, light sources, I should say, in general. Um, these are the common uh, forms, uh, sources that we do use in machine vision. Okay, LED, quartz halogen, and fiber optics, fluorescent, uh, and xenon, which is mostly used for strobing, just because it's extremely intense and you can drive it pretty hard. Now, um, my presentation is, is, a, is a bit LED-centric, um, but a lot of what I'm going to show you in terms of techniques can also be applied to these other uh, sources as well. So I just want to make that clear. Um, there are a few other sources out there that are used in microscopy, uh, not very common, so I'm certainly not going to spend any time on those. Um, I tabulated this some time ago. This is more or less background reference material for you to understand. Um, so um, I prefer something like this, which is, again, more um, visual. Uh, 
if you look at the sources, what I did here really was just plot life expectancy, uh, several criteria that you might use to select a source, okay? Um, I plotted life expectancy, for example, application flexibility, cost, how amenable is the source to strobing, um, um, one over the heat output, quite simply because it fits better with a larger envelope being more suitable, okay? Um, and so you can take a look at these three, and I see this is a little bit of an older slide, so uh, the, uh, we, we sort of changed our ideas on quartz halogen not being a good strobing source, so perhaps that should change a little bit. Um, but nonetheless, um, life expectancy LEDs, for example, very good. Um, output stability, also very good. Cost effectiveness per hour, good as well. Um, output intensity, uh, quartz halogens are still quite bright. Um, I think that LEDs are getting very, very close to that right now um, at that point. Um, two areas that, for example, LEDs are a little bit weak in yet, and this is still the case, are um, super high brightness and very large area illumination. Okay. So if you come to me and say, gee, you know, I need a source to, uh, to light up my work cell, okay, so that I can move a robot around in my work cell, um, big robot. Um, I'm not going to have a good solution. Now, certainly there is a solution, but you're not going to want to pay the price. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Again, cost effectiveness is, is, is a very real uh, issue. So it little, depends a little bit on exactly what your application is, is to which uh, is better. Okay. Um, I also want to sort of plot up these uh, different sources in terms of what their spectral output looks like. Okay, so obviously I'm just plotting intensity here um, in a relative sense um, against wavelength on the x-axis. Again, human vision uh, sensitivity, 400 to 700 nanometers there. But you can see the daytime standard really is, uh, is sunlight. Okay, that's going to be the most intense. Obviously, it's got the widest range. Uh, now, you'll notice that uh, we've done pretty good with xenon. Xenon does approach that same level. It's sort of lacking in the UV a little bit, and, and as well as the, uh, um, I say the near UV, or the very long, very short, uh, short blues, if you will. Um, but it's, it's a broad spectrum source, okay? Same thing with quartz halogen. Quartz halogens, if you've used those before, obviously, you're very familiar with uh, the amount of heat that they produce. Um, they produce a lot of IR. Okay, so that uh, is basically generated as some of it is thermal IR, so it's very warm. Um, you also look at the peaks, um, very useful uh, from mercury lamps. Okay, uh, you can use filters to isolate each of these peaks and apply that wavelength to something, um, particularly, uh, in particular, the uh, very short wavelength uh, down there at the end there, 320 or 340 nanometers. Very good uh, for um, getting a UV yield, okay, just by using a filter to block everything else and pass that UV light through, okay. I mean, this, the mercury lamp is uh, obviously, a, I work out of the Midwest, um, and we have um, a lot of mercury lamps out in the fields at the farmers. And if you walk under those with your uh, clothes on, you've got phosphorus in your, uh, your laundry, you'll notice it lights up. Well, that's that, that 340 UV that you're seeing coming from those lights. It's causing that to fluoresce. Hey, um, other tidbits I want to uh, point out here, um, white LEDs um, are interesting because you've got a broad spectrum there, that's the blue line, you've got a broader, broad spectrum relatively, but you've also got a big peak at 470, and you might be wondering, well, why is that? Because white LEDs are actually blue LEDs, um, that we use the blue light to um, fluoresce a white phosphor in the LED itself, and so you end up with a broad spectrum, but you still get a lot of blue input, okay, output, correct term. Um, Single LEDs as well, like reds, greens, or blues, um, single peaks, again, useful. Not as narrow, mind you, as, as what, you see in the, um, what you see in the purple or the mercury bands, but they're also useful, uh, and we'll show you how those are applied a little bit later. Um, standard LED types, I think we're pretty familiar with these. Um, T1 and 3 quarters, sort of the standard LED. It's been around for a million years, seems. Um, surface mount LEDs um, are out there as well. Um, what is interesting is with the LED culture is, is how much um, has changed in the last few years. The chemistry has gotten um, tremendously complex now to, to, to generate, to build these, design these LEDs and, and some of the performance. Um, the other thing that I wanted to make note of is the thermal, active thermal management, which you see nowadays. If you look at that graphic in the lower right-hand part of the screen, you can see uh, wh what's, uh, what's going on there. Uh, you have to have active thermal management to take care of the heat buildup that these LEDs do generate. We don't tend to think of an LED as being a hot source, and by and large, um, they aren't, but when they're driven with um, a lot of current, they can get quite warm, so you have to be able to deal with that. One of the issues we run into as well uh, in this industry in general with LEDs is uh, 
the thermal management required for multiple point sources in a single light is much, um, much more um, involved than just thermal um, management on a single LED. Okay. So we have to take that a step further from, say, the manufacturer, LED manufacturers. Okay. Um, Lifetimes, uh, some, some of this has changed a little bit recently, but uh, you'll notice uh, up front the, uh, the high current LEDs tend to be uh, uh, obviously a lot of radiant power. Uh, they tend to last longer. Um, that's not always the case, but even the UV LEDs now, which are normally were very short-lived, um, tend to last a lot longer now. We're up to 25, 30,000 hours on time. Okay. And that's considered a half-life. Okay. A half-life is quite simply defined as after one half-life, you have 50% of your intensity left still. And then another half-life, you have 50% of that intensity left. So it's an exponential function, square power. Okay. Um, so how does light and sample, um, your light and sample interact? That is uh, also is, is kind of forms the basis for what we talk about. Um, I mentioned I work out in the Midwest. I spend a lot of time in the auto patch. And uh, I get samples all the time that are metal, bright, and just reflective. Um, not that that's the only thing I get, but I get a lot of that. So I, I tend to deal more with that. But um, again, you've got to remember that when light is incident on a sample surface, um, you do get the possibility for reflections, obviously, as I mentioned. You get the possibility for being absorbed and, and diffused. Um, sometimes light is transmitted right through, and sometimes it's actually re-emitted later. Very shortly later, but later. Um, and that would be a secondary, like a secondary fluorescence. Um, now, a lot of samples, uh, I certainly worked with some samples that, that showed um, a little bit of all of these, okay? And uh, so it just depends a little bit on which is most important for you and which, which area you can apply your lighting to to get the best solution. In other words, the sample appropriate solution, okay? Um, another little uh, interesting point here, again, talking about reflective. Um, Angle of incidence always equals the angle of reflection on, a, on, on an object. Okay. We're going to use that to our advantage when I discuss the differences between bright field and dark field lighting. Um, another very important uh, key point here to remember, um, your point source intensity falls off as the inverse square okay, of the distance away from the sample. So the bottom line is you want to keep your light as close as possible to your sample because if you are at X and you've got, uh, you know, 4X intensity, you go to 2X working distance, you now have 1X intensity. So it drops off very dramatically. It's, it's a square function again, okay? Um, collimation is something else that obviously has been discussed and will be discussed in some of your other classes. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, another uh, interesting uh, tidbit, if you're dealing with diffusion or diffuse surfaces or diffuse lighting, whatever the case may be, uh, you may want to be familiar with this terminology, um, something called a solid angle. Okay? Um, the easiest way for me to explain it is to show you the differences okay, in terms of what is a, what's considered a small solid angle versus um, a large solid angle. Okay? So if you've got a ring light or a spotlight, relatively small solid angle. In other words, that angle that the light is coming from to be incident on the surface is relatively minor. Okay. Um, and as you increase your working distance, that angle gets even worse. Okay. And you're probably thinking, well, why does this make any difference? Well, if you look at a sample like uh, a light like this, a diffuse light, okay, a dome light, um, very large solid angle, uh, very good for imaging things like ball bearings. Okay, the surface of a ball bearing, a curved reflective surface is the best way to handle that. Okay, so if you look at all three together, you can see the difference. Um, so even if you end up uh, realizing you need a ring light geometry, okay, you can't use a diffuse light geometry. We'll talk about those pluses and minuses in a bit. Um, you can still hopefully optimize to some extent your um, solid angle as well if you need to, if you've got a problem with reflective surfaces doesn't always work, but it's something, again, to keep in mind. Okay. Um, again, light interaction. Um, I wanted to point this out because uh, I get this comment or this question a lot. Um, some of the concepts that we talk about in lighting um, are universally used in machine vision. Okay, they're used in lensing and optics in particular. Okay, and obviously those are things like contrast. Uh, the difference between bright and dark uh, resolution. You can have spatial resolution, you have spectral resolution. Okay. Focal length, fields of view, um, focuses, 
working distances or standoffs, and even sensitivity. All these are interrelated. And the reason I use this dome light as an example, because you really have to think about integrating what you know about your optics, what you know about your light, what you know about your sample into a single situation like this. So you take that dome light, for example, um, to be able to peek through that hole at the top, you've got to have a lens that allows you to do that without portholing around the top. And so you've got to make sure your working distance, your field of view, uh, and everything is, is um, designed to work properly with that dome. So again, conversion of convergence of concepts, very important issue. Um, and uh, you know, I, this will be, I'm sure, uh, stressed a lot through the rest of your coursework here, um, but um, you can't solve your vision problems working in a vacuum. You've got to be able to, to work with the camera. You've got to work with the optics and the lighting. They've all got to be worked together. Okay. Uh, can change gears a little. Um, talk about ambient light. And how we define ambient light is just quite simply any light other than your vision-specific lighting um, that the camera might collect. Okay. It could be anything. Overhead plant lighting. Okay. Um, task lighting. Um, indicator lights even. Any stray light, temporary lighting. Um, I've even had situations where I've walked in uh, to have sunlight being an issue. And I think anyone who's dealt with vision much knows that that does happen. And unfortunately, it can happen only certain times of the year, certain times of the day. Uh, very difficult to deal with. Okay. So um, um, I, we've all been there too. We've had interference with other vision system lighting. Okay, so nearby, another maybe another station close by. So how do we deal with these? I mean, how do we how do we negate or at least try to control uh, our ambient light? Now, a couple different ways. Um, I think this is the most effective, personally. Turn it off, right? The problem is you can't really do that on a plant floor. The uh, the, the plant manager gets rather upset when he sees this, and so it's not going to go there. Um, build a shroud. Okay, hide it. In other words, that's also known in, in our terminology as the doghouse. Um, but they can be time-consuming, they can be bulky and inexpensive as well. Um, uh, one of the ways that, that uh, I've dealt with it is overwhelm the ambient contribution with high brightness strobing. In other words, really overpower it, just completely overpower it. Uh, it's effective, um, but it is more complex and it's costly. And so you have to balance all those out. Um, some cases, um, I'll give you the, the reason why some, sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, but in some cases you can control it with a filter. I personally think that that is probably a better, a, the best approach if you can do it. Um, but the caveat is that it requires um, a narrow band source. Okay, in other words, a red or a blue or a green um, so that you can effectively block everything else out and transmit only the, the wavelength you're interested in collecting. Okay, so a white light, not gonna work. With a pass filter, that is. Okay, I'll show you some examples here in a bit. Quite soon. Uh, pass filters. Um, you exclude or prefer light based on a wavelength. That's really all you're doing. Okay. Um, if um, you've got a red light and a band pass filter um, and you're looking at fluorescent overhead lights, you can block 30, you know, 1 35th or all but 1 35th of that light. So it's a lot. Um, Wavelength, obviously, with sunlight and mercury vapors, it's not necessarily going to be as good because they have a, a large red contribution, and so you're, that's going to pass that light, okay? But um, they're good for that. Now, there are different types of pass filters. Um, there's a long pass, okay? And as, a, as the label implies, it passes the longer wavelengths and blocks the shorter ones. And we typically take the 50% point. You probably can't see it here. Uh, you will be able to on your slides. Um, but the uh, 50% point is where you label this. So this is a 715 nanometer long pass filter. Okay. Um, as you might expect, the flip side here is we have what's called a short pass filter. Same thing. Um, we'll pass shorter wavelengths, block longer wavelengths. Um, then, of course, there's the, the ever-present hybrid, which is really what we call the band pass filter. It's kind of the opposite, I guess, of what you might term a notch filter, which tends to do the other way. But bottom line is what it's doing is preferring this 660 light only, okay, and that's extremely valuable. Um, so here's an example. I had to mock this up in a laboratory, um, but if you have, these are two nylock nuts. Uh, one has nylon in it, the other one doesn't. Okay, you tighten it down and the, the nylon uh, uh, basically fills the gaps, heats up and seals the surface so the nuts are less likely to back out. Um, so all I did here really was um, I've got UV on, on the sample because UV is very good at fluorescing some nylons. Okay, most nylon, I guess. Um, 
And um, what I did was I just used a red light as an ambient light, in other words. So, I mean, if you look at the sample, I can say yes, okay, probably the one on the left doesn't have nylon, but your vision system would work a little bit harder for that, okay? Um, so really all I did here um, was put a short pass filter in there and that's all I happened to have. A better choice would have been uh, something that passed exactly the emission wavelength off the sample, the nylon, which is usually a purple, so you know, 420 or 440 nanometers. Um, but I didn't happen to have that. But the bottom line is you can see the difference in contrast. And so this is a much more sample appropriate um, technique for, for getting the most out of um, what you have. Okay, it's uh, uh, very much like a photographic negative. The quality um, that you get in or the appropriateness that you get in for your samples is much um, better, um, much less work for your vision system if it's done that way. Okay, that's the same thing with a photographic negative. Lousy negative, quality images kind of goes downhill. If you have to work more to process, okay? Um, contrast, you know, that's what vision in our world is all about, okay? It's all about creating contrast. And, and it's not just contrast alone, but there are a couple little caveats here too. Um, you, wanna, you wanna maximize your contrast and, and the key is to maximize that contrast on your features of interest, okay? In other words, those are the signal. That's, that's the signal part of, of your signal and noise. Um, you want to minimize the contrast conversely on everything else. Um, features of no interest, noise. Um, third one, um, and, and I personally think that this is very important because this gets left out a lot in, in, in terms of lighting solutions. And I'll show you some examples where, you know, we did one and two great, but we didn't do so well on number three necessarily. So, but the bottom line is you want to minimize your sensitivity to variations. Okay, in other words, you want to make your system as robust as possible. And sometimes this can be, you know, these differences can be anything. They can be part um, differences. They can be presence or change in ambient light, okay. Sample handling, presentation, whatever the case may be, um, they can be very minor. So again, number three, um, critical. You might solve a problem with one and two, but you know what, did you look at enough samples to say, yes, I have number three as well, okay? Very important. Uh, all right, again, we talk about contrast, it's so important. Well, how do we change it? Um, and this is where I talk about the four cornerstones, okay? Um, the first one, geometry. Um, you're really changing the light direction, okay, with respect to your sample and your camera, okay, that's, that's geometry. That's just that 3D relationship between your light, your, your sample, and your camera. That's all it is, right? Um, another way, change the structure of the light. Um, this is a little bit uh, harder to define because it can be a combination of the type of light you're using uh, as well as the illumination technique you're using. We'll talk about those shortly here. Um, you know, it depends on whether you're projecting a, a line, a spot, uh, using a dome, or you're, you're projecting a sheet of light. Um, but there are ways to take advantage of a different light pattern as well as a different geometry. Number three, um, change the spectrum or change the wavelength or color, if you will, if we're talking in the visible. Um, monochrome white, uh, um, you can look at, um, sample and camera response. Warm versus cool color families, I'm gonna show you an example of how that works as well. Um, very important to understand what that light is doing, not only to your object, but to your background. In other words, how is it interacting to change the contrast? Again, we're talking about how do we change contrast? The fourth way I, I've sort of discussed already, at least in one aspect of it, is, is using pass filters. In other words, how am I affecting the character of the light either before or after its uh, incident on a sample? All right. Uh, I should add, um, I get asked a lot, well, what, how do you do this? Do you just start at the top and work your way down? And I have to answer, yes, sometimes I do. Um, again, working in the auto patch, geometry is, is a primary consideration for me uh, oftentimes. Um, but that doesn't mean that after looking at a sample and, and analyzing what's happening, what features I'm trying to really um, get the best features, uh, interest of um, lighting on, uh, sometimes I'll start with color. Okay, but that's usually one of the first questions I get asked, well, what will IR light do for me uh, versus say white? Well, okay, let's, let's start over. Let's go back and let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at the whole package. Okay, what are you trying to do? What's your sample? Uh, and then we work our way down. And, and quite often, honestly, yes, I will start here. I will start at the top and work my way down. Unless I obviously know right away something different. All right, um, I just sort of threw this slide in here. Uh, tremendous number of wavelengths available now with the chemistry with just LEDs in general, okay? Um, and there are more and more of them every day, 
Um, there are companies who will custom um, design chemistries for you and wavelengths for you. Okay. Um, the important point here is this, and I've, I've touched on this already uh, earlier, but human eye does not see light the same as a film, um, as the same as a CCD sensor. Okay. So it's extremely important that you always keep that in mind. Play it on a monitor. Okay. And, and as an example, um, I just uh, this is a little bit of an older slide, but uh, there are a lot of different sensor types out there, and some of them obviously are designed for uh, different applications. I also plotted, uh, again, uh, the, uh, the human uh, night and uh, daytime um, vision sensitivities and ranges as well there. Okay. Just to give you an idea. So, again, um, sensor is a much more uh, attuned to being able to deal with the different wavelengths than human eye is. And some of them, obviously, if you take, for example, a CMOS sensor might be very good if you've got an IR light. Okay. Or perhaps IR is an advantage, but you need more sensitivity. A CMOS sensor might be a possibility. Okay. Again, right there, I just um, stated that already. Okay. Sensors and wavelength. I, this a little bit uh, older slide, but it's still very valid. Um, there are a lot of uh, changes happening and have been happening over the years in terms of sensors and is their ability to collect different wavelengths of light. Okay. Full frame sensors um, have gotten much better recently, uh, um, adding. Uh, Oh, adding uh, thin films to collect short wavelength light. Okay, um, interline transfer sensors, same thing. They've gotten deeper junction, so they can collect near IR better. Okay, and so again, sometimes if you do have to optimize the amount of sensitivity that you need, and it may not be critical. It depends a lot on the circumstances with the sample itself, um, and what you need to do with what camera you have. But um, it's worth understanding that that some of these are designed specifically to uh, collect far IR better, or collect short wavelength light better. Lighting geometry techniques. Okay, let's talk about those some. Um, we're going to talk about the basic lighting techniques right now. Um, I'm going to differentiate between bright field and dark field essentially. Okay. Um, bright field is any light, uh, all the lights in our room, our overhead lights are all bright field lights. Um, but they are point source lights. The sun is a bright field light. It's a point source light, even though it's bigger than we are. It's still a point source. Um, and typically, it's defined as being light higher than a uh, 45 degree angle of incidence on a surface. Okay. Dark field, um, on the flip side, is actually defined as being light on a 45 degree angle of incidence or less. We're going to take advantage of that here in a minute. I'll show you some examples. And then obviously we're going to discuss a little bit about backlighting. I think most of us are pretty intuitively familiar with that. Um, you're generating effectively a silhouette. So you've got a bright background and a dark object. Um, and um, some of the advanced techniques, uh, I'm going to cover some of these just very briefly so that we're, for completeness sake, we're more familiar with those. Um, I, again, as I, I think we all believe that redundancy is useful here. Um, so there's obviously a full bright field. Um, Again, high solid angle or very specific angles. Um, diffuse dome, axial diffuse light. Okay, that's a beam splitter light for those of you who are dull who are familiar with those, that terminology. Uh, there's also a newer sort of flat diffuse kind of light um, that is uh, useful as well. Uh, again, these are all diffuse techniques, but they're also known as full bright field. Okay, as opposed to say an overhead light, uh, which is a partial bright field. Partial bright field lights tend to give you more contrast, more shadowing edges, um, which is useful sometimes. You take advantage of that. Other times you don't want it. So you want to go to something like a, a full bright field or a diffuse technique. And there are other ones out there too. Um, you can have collimated backlighting. You can have collimated coaxial lighting. Um, Multi-axis combo lights. Um, you can combine lights that do, that have dark field um, and dome diffuse lighting techniques together. Okay, addressable rows, change angles, things of that sort. Those are all available out there. Structured lighting is, is becoming more and more common nowadays too. Uh, lasers, um, focused linears as well in the LED world. Um, there are LED projector lights out there as well nowadays, uh, although they're not as intense typically as, uh, as they would be um, with lasers. Okay, but partial bright field lights, uh, again, single lights, rings, spots, bars, uh, of that sort. Okay. Dark field lights. Um, dark field uh, can be 
bars can be rings, okay? And which one you pick depends a lot on the type of sample you're looking at. I'll show you some examples of where it's useful to use one versus the other. Um, but the advantage of using, say, a bar as a dark field light is it's really just the angle of incidence that you apply the light to the sample. And so uh, if you can get by with a linear dark field, a bar is, is a good choice because it's just the angle of incidence. Okay. So let's uh, talk about bright field versus dark field here a little bit. Typical coaxial ring light geometry. Okay. Bright field, camera looking down through a ring light um, onto a surface. Lights bouncing back up, camera's collecting it. Differentiate that with dark field. Okay. Uh, you'll see right away there are a couple of differences. The dark field light is, the light you notice is angled, again, because it's gotta be 45 degree angle or less. Okay. Um, two things you notice right away, um, as a result of the light being angled like that, the spot size is much smaller relative to the diameter of the light. Critical issue and one of the important points about dark field lighting in general. Okay, um, you don't get as big a spot as your entire light. And so you have to think about that when you're sizing for fields of view for your sample, okay. And obviously, you know, we can get the same size spot um, with the dark field versus the bright field light, yes, but we'd also have to have a, a light that's considerably larger and obviously more expensive, okay. So again, closer to the sample, that's another issue. Sometimes if you're dealing on a production floor, you can't have lights too close to your parts because things fly around, they break, um, things of that sort. Or maybe you've got an operator, a man in a loop, and so those are important issues to consider as well. So sometimes it's, uh, it's instructive to uh, keep that in mind as well. Okay. Dark field versus bright field here again. Uh, look at, let's look at it a little differently. Um, we've got a camera looking at a mirrored surface. Um, it's field of view is right there, okay? Um, so if I apply these application areas, as I call them, dark field would be the 45 degree or less, the gray area. Bright field would be the white area, okay, the higher angle. Um, and so let's apply lights in both of those and see what we get. All right, so if we put our lights in, a, in the bright field application area, again, what are we doing? We're looking at a mirrored surface. Odds are we're gonna see what? This. All we're gonna see is our nice LEDs or whatever our source may be. Okay, not very conducive to examining the surface of a sample. Um, however, if I take the lights and put them in the dark field application area, you can see uh, quite a difference here, okay? And so what happens is most of that light is actually hitting the surface and it's bouncing away, okay? And so the camera isn't actually seeing it, but what the camera does see is where that light gets scattered from that little scratch that's right in the middle of that, okay? And that's what you want. That's very sample appropriate lighting. Okay, so that gives you, if, if what you're after is surface analysis detail, that's, that's perfect, okay. Uh, this is probably a good place to stop, so this would be the end of session one.